Christians in the last 80 years or so have only been seeing things as bits and pieces. Instead of seeing things which have gradually, gradually begun to trouble Christians and others also of goodwill, such as over permissiveness, pornography, the problem of the public schools, the breakdown of the family, abortion, infanticide, the killing of newborn babies, the increased emphasis upon the euthanasia of the old, many, many other things. They have seen these as isolated bits and pieces instead of understanding that they, they are the only, they are the natural outcome of a change from a Christian worldview to a humanistic one. All these things and many more are only the results. We may be troubled with the individual thing, but in reality, we are missing the whole thing if we do not see each of these things and many more as only symptoms of the deeper problem. And that is a change in our society, a change in our country, a change in the Western world, from a Judeo-Christian consensus to a humanistic one. That is, instead of the final reality that exists, being the infinite creator God, instead of that which is the basis of all reality, being such a creator God, now largely all else is seen as only material or energy, which has existed forever in some form, shaped into its present complex form only by pure chance. And I want to say to you, those of you who are Christians, or even if you're not a Christian and you're troubled about the direction that our society is going in, that we must not concentrate merely on the bits and pieces, but we must understand that all these dilemmas come on the basis of moving from the Judeo-Christian worldview that the final reality is an infinite personal creator God over into this other reality, which let me re again speak of what it is, and that is the final reality is only energy or material in some mixture of form which has existed forever and which has taken its present shape by ch pure chance. The word humanism should be carefully defined. We should not just use it as a flag, as what I, the younger people might call a buzzword. We must understand what we're talking about when we use the word humanism. Humanism means that man is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. If this other final reality of material or energy shaped by pure chance is the final reality, it gives no meaning to life. It gives no value system. It gives no basis for law. And therefore, in this case, man must be the measure of all things. So humanism, properly defined, in contrast to, let's say, the humanities or humanitarianism, which is something entirely different and which Christians should be in favor of, both of these others. Humanism, being the measure of all things, comes naturally, mathematically, inevitably, certainly, if indeed the final reality is silent about these values, man must generate him from himself. So humanism is the absolute certain result if we choose this other final reality and say that is what it is. You must realize that when we speak of man being the measure of all things under the humanist label, the first thing is that man has only knowledge from himself, that he being finite, limited, uh, very faulty in his observation in many things, yet nevertheless has no possible source of knowledge except what man beginning from himself can find out by his own observation. Specifically, in this view, 
There is no place for any knowledge from God. But it is not only that man must start from himself in the area of knowledge and learning, but any value system must come arbitrarily from man himself uh, by arbitrary choice. And more frightening still, in our country, at our own moment of history, is the fact that any basis of law then becomes arbitrary. Merely certain people making decisions as to what is for the good of society at the given moment. Now this is the real re reason for the breakdown in morals in our country. It's the real reason for the breakdown in values in our country. And it is the reason that our Supreme Court now functions so thoroughly upon the fact of arbitrary law. They have no basis for law that is fixed. Therefore, like the young person who decides to leave, live hedonistically upon their own chosen arbitrary values, society is now doing the same thing legally. That a certain few people come together and decide what they arbitrarily believe is for the good of society at the given moment, at the given moment, and that becomes law. The worldview that the final reality is only material or energy shaped by pure chance, inevitably, that's the next word I would bring to you, inevitably, mathematically, with mathematical certainty, brings forth all these other results which are in our country and in our society, which has led to the breakdown in the country, in society, and which are its present sorrows. So if you hold this other worldview, you must realize that it is inevitable that we will come to the very sorrows of relativity and all these other things uh, that, are the, that are so represented in our country at this moment of history. It should be noticed that this new dominant worldview is the view is a view which is exactly opposite from that of the founding fathers who founded this country. Now, not all the founding fathers of this country were individually, personally Christians. That certainly is true. But nevertheless, they founded the country on the base that there is a God who is the creator. Now, I come to the next central phrase. Who is the creator who gave the inalienable rights. We must understand something very thoroughly. If society, if the state gives the rights, it can take them away. They're not inalienable. If the state gives the rights, they can change them and manipulate them. But this was not the view of the founding fathers of this country. They believed, though not all of them were individual Christians, that there was a creator and that this creator gave the inalienable rights. This upon which our country was founded and which has given us the freedoms which we still have, even the freedoms which are being used now to destroy the freedoms. The reason that these freedoms were there is because they believed there was somebody who gave the inalienable rights which indeed, therefore, limited the power of the state and the government specifically by these inalienable rights. But if we have the view that the final reality is material or energy, which has existed forever in some form, we must understand this view never, never, never would have given the rights which we now know and which unhappily I say to you, those of you who are Christians, too often you take all too all as much for granted. You forget that the freedoms we have had in Northern Europe after the Reformation in the United States is an extended extension of that as would be out uh, Australia or Canada or New Zealand and so on. You forget that the freedoms which we have are absolutely unique in the world. Occasionally, some of you have gone to university, have been taught that these freedoms are rooted in the Greek city-states. That is not true. 
All you have to do is read Plato's Republic and you understand that the Greek city-states never had any concept of the freedoms that we have. Go back into history, the freedoms which we have, the form freedom, balance of government, all these things, they are unique in history. And they're also unique in the world at this day. A fairly recent poll of the 150 some countries that now constitute the world shows that only about 25%, only 25 of these countries have any value, have any freedoms at all. What we have and take so poorly for granted is unique. It was brought forth by a specific worldview. And that specific worldview was the Judeo Christian worldview, and especially as it was refined in the Reformation, putting the authority indeed at a central point, not in the church and the state and the Word of God, but rather the Word of God alone. All the benefits which we know, I would repeat, which we have taken so easily and so much for granted, are unique. They have been founded on this certain worldview that there is a creator there to give the inalienable rights. And this other view over here, which has become increasingly dominant, of the material energy final worldview, shaped by pure chance, never would have, could not, has no basis of values in order to give such a balance of freedom that we have known so easily and which we unhappily, if we're not careful, take so for granted. We're now losing those freedoms and we can expect to continue to lose them if this other worldview continues to take increased force and power in our country. We can be sure of this, I would say it again, inevitably, mathematically, all these things will come forth. There's no possible way to heal the relativistic thinking of our own day if indeed all there is is a universe out there that is silent about any values. None whatsoever. It is not possible. It is a loss of values and there's a loss of freedom which we may be sure will continually grow. A good illustration is in the public schools. This view is taught in our public schools exclusively by law. There's no other view that can be taught. I'll mention it a bit later. But by law, there is no other view that can be taught. By law, in the public schools of the United States of America in 1982, legally there is only one view of reality that can be taught. And that is that the final reality is only material energy shaped by pure chance. It is the same with the television programs. Public television gives us many things that many of us like culturally, but is also completely committed to a propaganda position that the last reality is only material or energy shaped by pure chance. Clark's civilization, Bernowski, the ascent of man, Carl Saga, cosmos, they all say it. The new one that's on says it with great dogmatism. There is only one final view of reality that's possible, and that is that final reality is material or energy shaped by pure chance is about us on every side, and especially the government, and especially the courts, have become the vehicle to force this anti-God view on the total population. It's exactly where we are. The abortion ruling is a very clear one. The abortion ruling, of course, is also a natural result of this other worldview, because with this other worldview, human life, your individual life, has no intrinsic value. You are a wart upon the face of an absolutely impersonal universe. Your aspirations have no fulfillment in the what isness of what is. Your aspirations damn you. And many of the young people who come to us understand this very well because their aspirations of humanness have no fulfillment if indeed 
The final reality is only material or energy shaped by pure chance. The universe cannot fulfill anything that you say when you say it is beautiful. I love. It is right. It is wrong. These words are meaningless words against the backdrop of this other, this other worldview. So what we find is the abortion case should not have been a surprise because it boiled up out of, quite naturally, I would use the word again, mathematically, this other worldview. In this case, human life has no distinct value whatsoever. And we find that the Supreme Court, in one ruling, overthrew the abortion laws of all 50 states. And they made this form of killing human life, because that's what it is. The law declared that this form of killing human life was to be accepted. And for many people, because they had no set ethic, when the Supreme Court said that it was legal, for many people in the intervening years it has become ethical. The courts of this country have forced this view and its results on the total population. What we find that as the courts have done this, without any longer that which the founding fathers comprehended of law, a man like Blackstone with his commentaries understood, the other of the lawgivers of this country in the beginning, and that is that there is a law of God upon which gives foundation. When the courts of this country cut themselves loose from the law of God, it becomes quite natural then that they, should all, they would also cut themselves loose from a strict constructionism concerning the Constitution. Everything is relative. So as you cut yourself loose from the law of God in any concept whatsoever, you also soon are cutting yourself loose from a strict constructionism, and each ruling is to be seen as an arbor arbitrary choice uh, by a group of people as to what they may honestly think is for the sociological good of the community, of the country, for the given moment. Now, along with that is the fact that the courts are increasingly making law, and thus we find that the legislature's powers are increasingly diminished in relationship to the power of the courts. Now, the pro-abortion people have been very wise about this in the last, say, 10 years, and Christians very silly. And I wonder sometimes where we've been, because the pro-abortion people have used the courts for their end rather than the legislature's because the courts are not subject to the people's thinking nor their will, either by election nor by a re-election. Consequently, the courts have been the vehicle that has been used to bring this whole view and to force it on our total population. It has not been largely the legislatures. It has been, the, rather, the courts. The result is a relativistic value system a lack of any final meaning to life. A lack of any final meaning to life, that's first. Why does human life have any value at all? If that is all the reality is. If not only you're going to die individually, but the whole human race is going to die. Someday, and it need not take the falling of the atom bombs, but someday the world will grow too hot, too cold, that's what we're told, on this other final reality. And someday all you people not only will be individually dead, but the whole conscious life on this world will be dead. And nobody will see the birds fly. And there's no meaning to life. And you know I don't speak academically. Shut off in a scholastic cubicle as it is. I have lots of young people and older ones come to us and from the end of the earth. And as they come to us, this really, they have gone to the end of this logically, and they're not living in a romantic setting. They realize what the situation is. They can't find any meaning to life. It's the meaning of the black poetry. It's the meaning of the black plays. It's the meaning of all this. It's the meaning of the words of punk rock. And I must say that on the basis of what they're being taught in school, that the final reality is only this material thing, they're not wrong. They're right. They're not wrong. They're right. On this other basis, there is no meaning to life. 
And not only there is no meaning to life, but there is no value system that is fixed. And we find uh, that the law is based then only on a relativistic basis and that law becomes purely arbitrary. And this is brought to bear specifically and perhaps most clearly in the public schools, I'll come to that now, in this country, in the courts of this country, saying that it's absolutely illegal. It's absolutely illegal uh, from the lowest grades up through university for the schools, the public schools of this country, to teach any other worldview except this worldview of final material or energy. Now, this is done no matter what the parents may wish. This is done regardless of what those who pay the taxes for their schools may wish. I'm giving an illustration as well as making a point. The way the courts force their view, and this view of the false view of reality, on the total population, no matter what the total population wants. We find that in the January 18th, just recently, Time magazine, there was an article that said that there was a poll uh, that pointed out that about 76% of the people in this country thought it would be a good idea to have both creation and evolution taught in the public schools. I don't know if the poll was accurate, but assuming that the poll was accurate, what does it mean? It means that your public schools are told by the courts that they cannot teach this even though 76% of the people in the United States want it taught. I'll give you a word. It's tyranny. There is no other word that fits at such a point. And at the same time, we find the medical profession has radically changed. Dr. Koop, in our seminars for Whatever Happened to the Human Race, often said that when I, speaking himself, when I graduated from medical school, the idea was, how can I save this life? But for a great number of the medical students now, it's not how can I save this life, but should I save this life? Believe me, it's everywhere. It isn't just abortion, it's a fantasy. It's allowing the babies to starve to death after they're born if they do not come up to some doctor's concept of a quality of life worth living. And I just say in passing and never forget it. It takes about 15 days often for these babies to starve to death. And I'd say something else that we haven't stressed enough. In abortion itself, there is no abortion method that is not painful to the child. Just as painful that month before birth as the baby you see in one of these cribs down here at I pass a month after the birth. Just as painful. So what we find, what we find then, is that the medical profession has largely changed. Not all doctors. I'm sure there are doctors here in the audience who feel very, very differently, who feel indeed that human life is important and you wouldn't take it easily, wantonly. But in general, we must say, and all you have to do is look at the TV programs, all you have to do is to hear about the increased talk about the youth and allowing the mongoloid child, the child with the Down syndrome, to starve to death <clears throat> if it's born this way. Increasingly, we find on every side the medical profession has changed its views. The view now is, is this life worth saving? I look at you. You're an older congregation than I'm usually used to speaking to. You better... You better think, because this means you. It does not stop with abortion and the founder's side. It stops with the question, what about the old person? Is he worth hanging on to? Is he worth hanging on to? Should we, as they're doing in England in this awful, awful organization, exit, teach older people to commit suicide? Should we help them get rid of them? because they're an economic burden, a nuisance. I want to tell you, once you begin chipping away in the medical profession at the intrinsic value of human life, founded upon the Judeo-Christian concept that man is unique because he is made in the image of God, and his value is not because he's well, strong, a consumer, 
a sex object, or any other thing. His value is intrinsic because he is unique in the universe as made in the image of God. That is where whatever co compassion this country has, and certainly it's far from perfect and it's never been perfect, nor out of the Reformation has there been a golden age, but whatever compassion there's ever been, it's rooted in the fact that our culture knows that man is unique as made in the image of God. Take it away, and I just say gently, the stopper is out of the bathtub for all human life. The January 11 Newsweek has an article about the baby in the womb. The first five or six pages are marvelous. If you haven't seen that, you should dig it, ask, see if you can get that issue. It's January 11th, and about the first five or six pages shows conclusively what every biologist has known all along, and that is human life begins at conception. There is no other time for human life to begin except at conception. Monkey life begins at conception. Donkey life begins at conception. And human life begins at conception. Biologically, there's no discussion. Never should have been from a scientific viewpoint. I'm not speaking of religious, no. And this five, six pages, very carefully, goes into the fact that human life begins at conception. But the, you flip the page, and there's a big black headline, but is it a person? But is it a person? And I'll read the last sentence. But, or no, the problem is not determining when actual human life begins. The Five pages before that shown that. But when the value of that life begins to outweigh other considerations, such as the health or even the happiness of the mother. I'm not just talking about the health of the mother. It's a propaganda line. Or even the happiness of the mother. Listen, spell that out. It means that the mother, for her own hedonistic happiness, selfish happiness, can take human life by her choice, by law. Do you understand what I've said? By law, on the basis of her individual choice of what makes her happy, she can take what has been declared to be in the first five pages to be, with, without any question, human life. In other words, they acknowledge the human life is there, but it's an open question to whether it is not right to kill that human life if it makes the mother unhappily. And basically, that is no different than Stalin, Mao, or Hitler killing who he killed for what he conceived to be the good of society. There is absolutely no line between the two statements. No absolute line whatsoever. It one follows along. Once it is from the other. Once it is acknowledged that it is human life that is involved, and as I've said, this issue in Newsweek shows conclusively that it is. Once it is acknowledged that it is human life that is involved, the acceptance of the death of human life in babies born or unborn opens the door to the arbitrary taking of any human life. From then on, it's purely arbitrary. It's purely arbitrary. It was this view that opened the door to all that followed in Germany prior to Hitler. It's an interesting factor that the only Supreme Court in the Western world that has ruled against easy abortion is the Ger West German Supreme Court. And the reason they did it is because they knew, in its clear history, that this view of human life in the medical profession and the legal profession combined, before Hitler came on the scene, is what opened the way for everything that happened in Hitler's Germany. And so the German Supreme Court has voted against easy abortion because they know, they know very well where it leads. I want to say something tonight. There are not many of you are black in this audience. I can't tell if you're Puerto Rican. But if I were in the minority group in this country tonight, 
I would be afraid. I've had big, gorgeous blacks stand up in our seminars and say, Sir, do you think there's a racial twist to all this? And I have to say, right on. You've hit it right on the head. You've hit it right on the head. And once this door is open, once this door is open, there is something to be afraid of. Christians should be deeply concerned. And I cannot understand why the liberal lawyer of the Civil Liberties Union is not scared to death by this open door toward human life. Everyone ought to be frightened who knows anything about history, anything about the history of law, anything about the history of medicine. This is a terrifying door that is open. Abortion in itself would be worth spending much of our lifetimes to fight against because it is the killing of human life. But it's only a symptom of the total. What we're facing is humanism. <coughs> Man the measure of all things, viewing final reality being only material or energy shaped by chance, therefore human life having no intrinsic value, therefore the keeping of any individual life or any groups of, hum of human life being purely an arbitrary choice by society at the given moment. The flood doors, the flood doors are wide open. I fear both they and too often the Christians do not have just relativistic values because unhappily Christians can live with relativistic values unhappily. But I fear that often they, such people as the liberal lawyers of the Civil Liberties Union and Christians do not have just relativistic values, but they're also just plain stupid in regard to the listen, lessons of history. Nobody who knows his history could fail to be shaken at the corner we have turned in our culture. Remember why? Because of the shift in the concept of the basic reality. Now, we cannot be at all surprised when the liberal theologians support these things because liberal theology is only humanism using theological terms and that's all it ever was all the way back into Germany right after the Enlightenment. So when they come down uh, on the side of, of easy abortion and the fantasy, some of these de liberal denominations as well as theologians are doing, we shouldn't be surprised. It follows as night the day. But I have a question to ask you. I have a question to ask you, and that is, where have the Bible-believing Christians been in the last 40 years? All this that I'm talking about has only come in the last 80 years. I'm 70. I just had my birthday, so just 10 years older than I am. None of this was true in the United States. None of it. And the climax has all come within the, within the last 40 years, which falls within the intelligent scope of many of you sitting in this room. Where have the Bible-believing Christians been? We shouldn't be surprised. The liberal theologians have been no help. But where have we been as we have changed to this other consensus and all the horrors uh, and st stupidity at the present moment has come down upon our culture? We must recognize that this country is close to being lost. Not first of all because of a humanist conspiracy. I believe there, is, there are those who conspire, but that is not the reason this country is almost lost. This country is almost, not, uh, almost lost not because of a humanist conspiracy, but because the Bible-believing Christians in the last 40 years who have said that they know that the final reality is this infinite personal God who is the creator and all the rest, they said they have known it, and they've done nothing about it as the consensus has changed. There's been a vast silence. The Christians of this country have simply been silent. Much of the evangelical leadership has not raised a voice. As a matter of fact, it was almost like sticking pins into the evangelical constituency in most places to get them interested in the issue of human life as Dr. Coop and Frankie and I worked on whatever happened to the human race. A vast, vast silence. I wonder what God has to say to us. 
All the ease we have. All the freedoms we have. All the secondary blessings we've had out of the preaching of the gospel. And we have let it slip through our fingers in the lifetime of most of you here. Not a hundred years ago. It's been in our lifetime in the last 40 years that these things have happened. It's not only been the Christian leaders. Where have the Christian lawyers been? Why haven't they been challenging this change uh, in the view of what the First Amendment means, which I'll deal with in a second? Where have the Christian doctors been speaking out against the rise of the abortion clinics and all the other things? Where have the Christian businessmen been to put their lives and their work on the line concerning these things which they would say as Christians are central to them? Where have the Christian educators been as we've lost our educational system? Where have we been? Where have each of you been? What's happened in the last 40 years? This country was founded on a Christian base with all its freedom for everybody. Let me stress that. This country was founded on a Christian base with all its freedom for everybody, not just Christians, but all its freedom for everyone. And now this is being largely lost. We live not 10 years from now, but tonight in a humanistic culture. And we are rapidly moving at express train speed into a totally humanistic culture. We're close to it. We are in a humanistic culture, as I point out in the public schools and the, uh, these other things. But we are moving toward a totally humanistic culture and moving very quickly. Congress opens with prayer. Why? Because Congress always is open with prayer. Back there, the Founding Fathers didn't consider the 13 provincial uh, congresses that sent representatives to form our country in Philadelphia. They didn't consider these provincial congresses really open until there was prayer. The Congress in Washington, where Edith and I have just been speaking to various men in political, in political areas and circles, that Congress is not open until there's prayer. But the children cannot pray on the geography of a public school. How stupid can we be? Why can't, why can't everyone understand the change that has come? Congress must open with prayer. It's illegal in many places for youngsters to merely meet and pray on the geographical location of the public schools. I would repeat. We are not only immoral, we are stupid. I mean that. I don't know which is the worst, being immoral or stupid on such an issue. We are not only immoral, we are stupid to the place for the place we have allowed ourselves to come to with not, without noticing. I would now repeat again the word I used before. There is no other word one can use for our present situation that I've just been describing except the word tyranny. Tyranny. That's what we face. We face a worldview which never would have given us our freedoms, forced upon us by the courts and the government, hold, the men holding this other worldview. Whether we want it or not, and even, it's, even though it's destroying the very freedoms, which give the freedoms for the excesses and for the things which are wrong. And we who are Christians and others who love liberty should be acting in our day as the founding fathers acted in their day. Those who founded this country believed that they were facing tyranny. All you have to do is read their writings. That's why the war was fought. That's why this country is founded. They believed that God never, never, never wanted people to be under tyrannical governments. They did it not as a pragmatic or an economic thing, though that was involved too, I guess, but for principle. They were against tyranny. And if the Founding Fathers stood against tyranny, we ought to recognize in this year, 1982, if they were back here and one of them was standing right here, he'd say the same thing. What you're facing is tyranny. The very kind of tyranny we fought, he would say, in order that we might escape. 
And we face a, a very hidden censorship. Every once in a while, as soon as we begin to talk about the need of re-entering Christian values into the discussion, someone shouts Khomeini, someone says what you're after is a theocracy. Absolutely not. We must make absolutely plain we are not in favor of a theocracy, in name or in fact. But having said that, nevertheless, we must realize that we already face a hidden censorship. A hidden censorship in which it is impossible to get the other worldview presented in something like public television. It's absolutely impossible. I could give you a couple examples. I'll give you one because it's so close to me. And that is after we made whatever happened in the human race, Frankie made an 80-minute 80, 80 cutting for TV of the first three episodes of whatever happened in the human race. And people who know television say it's one of the best television films they've ever seen technically. So that's not a problem. And their representative presented it to a director of the uh, public television. And as soon as she heard, happened to be a woman, I'm sure that it's just incidental, but as soon as she heard that it was against abortion, she said, we can't show that. We only show things that give both sides. And at exactly the same time, they were showing that abominable hard choices, which was just straight propaganda for abortion. And as I point out, the study guide that went with it here and point out in uh, the a Christian manifesto, I give a long quote from it. The study guide was even worse. It was calling and saying that the only possible view of, uh, of reality was this material thing, this material reality. They spelled it out in that study guide more clearly than I have tonight is what the issue is. But they said, that's it. What do you call that? That's hidden censorship. Dr. Coop, one of the great surgeons of the world, when he was nominated as Surgeon General, much of the press, great swelling things against him, a lot of them not true, a lot of them twisted. Certainly, though, lots of space made for uh, trying to not get his nomination accepted. When it was accepted, I looked for mad, like mad in some of the papers, and most of them what I found was about one inch on the third page that said Dr. Coop had been accepted. What do you call that? Just one thing, hidden censorship. You must realize that this other view is totally intolerant. It is totally intolerant. I do not think we are going to get another opportunity if we do not take it now in this country. I would repeat, we're a long way down the road. I do not think we're going to get another opportunity. If the Christians, specifically, but others also who love liberty, but specifically the Christians, do not do something about it now, I don't believe your grandchildren are going to get a chance. I don't believe so. In the present so-called conservative swing in the last election, we have an opportunity. But we must remember this, and I would really brand this into your thinking, a conservative humanism is no better than a liberal humanism. A conservative humanism is no better than a liberal humanism. It's the humanism that is wrong, not merely the coloration. And therefore, at the present moment, what we must insist on by, to the people in our government who represent it is that we do not just end with words. We must see at the present opportunity, if it continues, we must see a real change. We mustn't allow it just to be drift off into mere words. Now I want to say something with great force right here. What I've been talking about, whether you know it or not, is true spirituality. This is true spirituality. Spirituality, after you're a Christian and have accepted Christ as Savior, means that Christ is the Lord of all your life and not just your religious life. And if you make a dichotomy in these things, you are denying your Lord his proper place. And I don't care how many butterflies you have in your stomach, you are poor spiritually. True spirituality means that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of all of life and except for the things that are specifically told us in the Bible are sinful and we set them aside, except for that all of life is spiritual and all of life is equally spiritual and that includes 
as our far forefathers did, standing for these things of freedom and standing for these things of human life and all these other matters that are so crucial, if indeed this living God does exist as we know that he does exist. We have forgotten our heritage. A lot of the evangelical comp likes to talk a lot about the old revivals, and they tell us we ought to have another revival. We need another revival. You and I need the revival. There ought to be constant revival in our hearts. But they've forgotten something, and most of, most of the Christians have forgotten something, and most of the pastors have forgotten something. And that is the factor that every single revival that there's ever been a real revival, whether it was the Great Awakening before the American Revolution, whether it was the great revivals in Scandinavia, whether it was Wesley and Whitfield, wherever you have found a great revival, it's always had three parts. First, it has called for the individual to accept Christ as Savior, and thankfully in all these that I've named, thousands have been saved. Then it's called upon the Christians to bow their hearts to God and really let the Holy Spirit have his place and fullness in their life. But there's always, in every revival, been a third element. It has always brought social change. Cambridge theologians, Cambridge historians would tell you who aren't Christians that if it wasn't for the Wesley revival and the social change that Wesley's revival had brought, that England would have had its own form of the French Revolution. It was Wesley saying people must be treated correctly and dealing down into the social needs of the day that made it possible for England to have its bloodless revolution in contrast to France's bloody revolution. The Wall Street Journal, not too long ago, and I quote it again in uh, a Christian manifesto, pointed out that it was the Great Awakening, that great revival prior to the founding of the United States, that opened the way and prepared for the founding of the United States. Every one of the great revivals had tremendous social implications. What I'm saying is that I'm afraid that we have forgotten our heritage. And we must step or go on, even when the cost is high. I think the church has failed to meet its obligation in these last 40 years for two specific reasons. The first is this false, false truncated view of spirituality that doesn't see true spirituality touching all of life. And the other thing is, too many Christians, whether the doctors, lawyers, pastors, evangelists, whatever they are, too many of them afraid to really speak out so because they did not want to rock the boat for their own project. And I'm convinced that these two reasons, both of which are a tragedy and really horrible for the Christian, both of the two together are an explanation why we have walked the road we have walked in the last 40 years. You must understand it's going to cost you to take a stand in these things. There are doctors who are going to get kicked out of hospitals because they refuse to perform abortions. There are nurses who see a little sign on a crib, do not feed, and they feed, and they're fired. There's a cost. There's a cost. But I'd ask you, I'd ask you, what is loyalty to Christ worth to you? What is loyalty to Christ worth to you? How much do you believe this is true? Why are you a Christian? Are you a Christian because for some lesser reason? Or are you a Christian because you know this is the truth of reality? And then how much do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? How much are you willing to pay the price for loyalty to the Lord Jesus? We must absolutely set out to smash the lie of the new and novel concept of the separation of religion from the state. Uh, which now most people hold, and which Christians have just bought a bill of goods. This is new and it is novel. It has no relationship to the meaning of the First Amendment. The First Amendment only was passed for two reasons. First, that there would be no, there would be no united church of the whole 13 colonies. And most people don't realize that Almost every one of the 13 colonies had some special relationship to some church, and even this wasn't counted against the First Amendment. And the second thing for the First Amendment was that the state would never interfere with religion. 
And that's all the meaning there was to the First Amendment. Just read Madison and the Spectator papers if you don't think so. That's all it was. Now we've turned it over. We put it on its head. What we must do is to absolutely insist we return to what the First Amendment meant, meant in the first place. Not that religion can have an influence into society and into the state. Not that. But we must insist that there's the freedom that the First Amendment really gave. Now with this we must emphasize, and I said it, but let me say it again. We do not want a theocracy. I personally am opposed to a theocracy. On this side of the New Testament, I do not believe this place for a theocracy till Jesus the King comes back. But that's a very different thing while stay saying clearly we are not in favor of a theocracy in name or in fact. That's a very different thing from where we are now where all religious influence is shut out of the processes of the state and the public schools. We're only asking for one thing. We're asking for the freedom that the First Amendment guaranteed to us. That's what we should be standing for. What we want is a return to real freedom and especially real freedom for all religions. Notice all religions, not just ourselves. And then in the midst of that freedom, Christianity having freedom from this hidden censorship, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, being able to really present itself in the free marketplace of ideas without being held back, without a false censorship. That's what we want. That's what we should be struggling for. All we ask for is what the founding fathers of this country stood and fought and died for. And at the same time, very crucial in all this, is standing absolutely for a high view of human life against the snowballing low view of human life of which I've been talking. This thing that is presented under the hypocritical name of choice. Choice. Hypocritical names. Choice. What does choice equal? Choice, as I've already shown, means the right to kill for your own selfish desires. To kill human life. That's what the choice is that we're being presented with on this other basis. Now I come toward the close. And that is we must recognize something from the scripture, and that's why I had the scripture read that I had read tonight. When a government when a government negates the law of God, it abrogates its authority. God has given certain offices to restrain chaos in this fallen world. But the, it does not mean that these offices are autonomous. And when a government, when a government commands that which is contrary to the law of God, it abrogates its authority. The whole history of the Christian church, and again, I wish people knew their history. And again, in a Christian manifesto, I stress what happened in the Reformation in reference to all this. At a certain point, it is not only the privilege, but it is the duty of the Christian to disobey the government. Now, that's what the Founding Fathers did when they founded this country. That's what the early church did. That's what Peter said. You heard it from the Scripture. Should we obey man rather than God? That's what the early Christians did. Occasion, no, often. People say to me, but the early church didn't practice any civil disobedience, didn't they? You don't know your history again. When those Christians that we all talk about so much allowed themselves to be thrown into the arena, when they did that, from their view it was a religious thing. They would not worship anything except the living God. But you must recognize from the side of the Roman state there was nothing religious about it at all. It was purely civil. The Roman Empire had disintegrated to the only unity it had was this worship of Caesar. And you could be an atheist. You could worship the Zoroastrian religion. You could do anything. They didn't care. It was a civil matter. And when those Christians stood up there and refused to worship Caesar from the side of the state, they were rebels, they were civil, in civil disobedience, and they were thrown to the beast. They were involved in civil disobedience. As much as your brothers and sisters in the Soviet Union are night, when the Soviet Union says by law they cannot tell their children, even in their home, about Jesus Christ, and they must disobey, and they get sent off to the mental ward or to Siberia. Exactly the same kind of civil disobedience that's represented in a very real way by the thing I'm wearing on my lapel tonight. 
Every appropriate legal and political governmental means must be used. But the final bottom line, I've invented this term in a Christian manifesto and I hope the Christians across this country and across the world will really understand what the Bible truly teaches. The final bottom line, the early Christians, every one of the reformers, and again I'll say in a Christian manifesto, I go through country after country and show that there was not a single place with a possible exception of England where the Reformation was successful where there wasn't civil disobedience and disobedience to the state. But we must realize the bottom line, the early Christians, the people of the Reformation, the founding father of this country faced and acted on is the realization that if there is no place for disobeying the government, that government has been put in the place of the living God. In such a case, the government has been made a false God. If there is no place for disobeying a human government, that government has been made God. Caesar, under some name, thinking of the early church, has been put upon the final throne. The Bible's answer is no. Caesar is not to be put in the place of God. And we as Christians, in the name of the Lordship of Christ, in all of life, must so think and act on the appropriate level and should always be on the appropriate level we have lots of room to move yet with our cases with our court cases with the people we elect all the things that we can do in this country in the name of the lordship of christ and all of life we must so think and act on the appropriate level and if unhappily we come to that place the appropriate level must also include a disobedience to the state if you're not doing that and you haven't thought it through, Jesus is not really on the throne. God is not central. You have made a false God central. Christ must be the final Lord and not society and not Caesar. Now repeat the final sentence again. Christ must be the final Lord and not Caesar and not society. I wonder if we can pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come together and we have no illusions that these things are serious. But we have no illusions either that it was serious to the early church when they watched their loved ones dragged off and thrown to their death when all they had to do was say they worship Caesar. We have no illusions that it was easy for Peter to stand and say he would obey God rather than the Sanhedrin. We have no illusion that our Reformation forefathers who won the liberties we have not only in church but in state, that it was easy for them in those hard and difficult days. And our Heavenly Father, we would ask tonight that you will forgive the Christians of the United States May we be repentant for the silence of the last 40 years when we have denied what we say we believe by our silence. We ask thee that you'll stir the church of the Lord Jesus across this country, across northern Europe, across other places. Give us that which our Heavenly Father Wesley really understood. Finney the evangelist that most people know in this country, Whitfield, and many of the others. A call for the individual to accept Christ as Savior and come under the shed blood of Christ and pass from death to life. A call for those of us who are Christians, oh God, to bow our hearts more completely and not let other things get in the way, to let the Holy Spirit have his, his place under the teaching of Scripture and within the circle of the teaching of Scripture. And then our Heavenly Father to realize that everything belongs to the Lord Jesus. That He died not only to take our souls to heaven, but that our bodies will be raised one day from the dead. The one day, as Peter said, just right after His ascension, that He's going to heaven until He comes back to restore all things. That His death there on Calvary's cross is for us individually, 
but it's not egotistically individualistic. Our individual salvation will one day be a portion of the restoration of all things. And it's our calling until he comes back again that happy day. To do all we can, while it won't be perfect, is when he comes back to see substantial healing in every area that he will then perfectly heal. And that Wesley did understand, Finney understood, a man like Blanchard who founded Wheaton College, he understood that if there's a true preaching of the gospel, it carries with it then an action out into the social life around us, into the world. That the church is to preach the gospel, but it's to live the good news. That there are answers to these horrendous questions. That there are answers. And that we might see a turning back from the absolute tragedy and tyranny, but tragedy, which we face in our Western culture and in this country tonight. Help us, forgive us, use us. And Father, as we just think of the number of people sitting here from so many different backgrounds and different churches and different levels of life, if only these things were carried out into something in the power of the Holy Spirit, into the totality of life as, as salt and light, that we might make a change and save this country from utter tragedy. Help thou us, so we ask. And we ask it in no lesser name than the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lamb and our God. Amen.